I'm just going to try and take one toad at a time. We took some of our most uh, common failure pistons and, and tried to, you know, put them away here. So we've got even more upstairs and we're going to look at some of the worst. So I'll just start grabbing one of these and take a look at it. You guys saw from the video here where they were really paying attention to whether you could actually see the machining marks on the piston. So when this is made, it's poured into molten aluminum and then they spin it on a machine and it leaves these little uh, cutting or grinding marks. So if you look at this piston here, it looks to be in pretty good shape. Full skirts, no damage. This is more from just banging around a box than anything else. But what I, uh, before someone, you know, someone started to clean this, but it had a nice chocolate brown on it. And you remember in the video how he was talking about you could see the underside and see the brown as well. Because so we got through that two stroke, we got it going on above and below the piston. Um, we got some oil holes for our pin here. And uh, this. This piston here is probably just a good used piston that was taken out of service. What I want you to look for when you pass this around is I want you to pay attention to the machine marks. The machine marks that go around so that you know what Suzuki was talking about in the video. And please don't drop it. Okay. This is that Weisco logo that we talked about. You guys saw it imprinted on the laser etch. Now this is a molly coated piston or a coated te Teflon coated piston if you will. Uh, they'll put these on the skirts and especially helps for that break into that brand new piston. It's real common that once it starts running, it'll wear that Teflon off, okay? You can see here that we had physical damage that got from the top of the piston and worked its way down and, and basically took and smeared aluminum all the way across here. This is going to be hard on the cylinder to the point that it needs serviced, but the piston's taking the blunt of the damage. Um, the other thing here is just kind of more of a dull color mm -hmm. and the piston here is pretty dry so you bet this thing was running too lean and not having oil mm -hmm. and then when we look at this side we definitely know that we didn't have oil on this piston it is just smeared all over the place something was going on here where we did not get oil now that's the exhaust side of the piston is there just a chance that it wasn't sized right and heated up so fast that it just drug across the cylinder yeah, yeah. I got a question. yep on this piston yep turn it why is this all cut out for the wrist pin? Wait. Wait? Yeah, any time that they can get rid of an area. So his question was, why is this cut out? Versus you look at how this one isn't. You look at how this one is cut out. You can see here there's going to be different shapes and sizes of these. I'll find a, this is another one that um, we'll see. You see how it's relieved there? They are very structural on where they put these reliefs in. Do you remember in the Suzuki video how they talked about uh, what parts of the piston expand the soonest? Remember, talk, remember that in the Suzuki video? Yeah, so like talking about. They, they did a cutaway and they were showing that where it's really thick here, that's not going to expand that fast, but it's, it's really thin right here, right here, you know, on those four corners. It's really thin here at the skirt. So those are the areas that are going to expand pretty fast. All right. Um, another thing, so these are the newer style Wisco pistons that have the uh, laser engraving there. Here's an older one that I was talking about that has the casted uh, little W there. Do you see that right there? And when I say older, you're still going to find tons of these in production, but um, it's actually a raised casted portion instead of just engraved. That's the older uh, Wisco logo too. Now they've gone to more of this uh, squ you know, squared off edge instead of the rounded circles on there. So. So we saw this in the video too where they talked about it uh, um, uh, having an ignition problem and basically just melting that piston away. Can you actually see the splatter of all the aluminum on top of the piston? Mm -hmm. yeah. Man, it's just it's a thick coating of that. That actually uh, went pretty quick. Now the, the, the fact that this is pretty wide, this probably happened under full throttle. I mean just completely brap on the pipe and then it smeared it off and finally poked through. So. Uh, this is a really good opportunity to look and see, like, here's what I want you guys to do, so you can watch the video. I'm, I'm not intentionally trying to remove it, but if you just take and fill inside here, you can actually see where the aluminum has sprayed onto the skirt wall. Okay? You'll see that it's actually sprayed onto there and attached. If it's sprayed there, it's, where else is it? So the crank, the cylinder, the bearings, everything else. I'll go ahead and pass that around. You got it? Yep. You guys make sure you don't drop it. So... Here's a one with full seizure all the way around. Any any thoughts on this one here? The rings are stuck. Nope, I'm sorry, the rings are out. Any ideas on this guy? Zero lubrication. Yeah, probably ran straight fuel. 
that make sense? Is there a chance that somebody forgot to mix their oil? Yep. <clears throat> a really good chance on that one. So, big old chunk out of the side of that. This one here is our good one. Passed around too. That's a decent one. Those are both good. All right, I want to see this guy. That's the blaster piston. Oh, well, this is yours? Yep. Okay. This piston's actually pretty good. This is what I'd like to have to show um, that it's just got minimal blow-by, so we don't see the carbon tracking like all the way down the piston. You can still see some of the, the machining marks in it, so it's just a good used piston. Uh, we don't see any scoring or scratching on it. This thing was uh, in pretty decent shape. Now look at this right here. Do you see where there's this one smear over here? Okay, not to where I can fill it with my fingernail, but that's an evidence of a cold seizure. Okay, I can't feel it's not that bad, but did somebody get on it a little too hard too soon? Yeah. yeah. When it's when it's going down the sides there, that's what we got going on. So this this visually looks like a decent piston, other than it could use rings. There's those steel pins that we're talking about. You got to ask yourself this: if you've got it torn all the way down and you choose not to put a piston in it on a customer vehicle, you're really being risky. Okay. You get what I'm saying? If it's your own vehicle, um, it's not so bad. I mean, if it's if it's not wore out, it's not wore out. But this is something I would definitely uh, use and some caution on. Definitely depends on where it is in the service limit, whether it's <coughs> place or not. If it's towards the edge or whatnot. So, well, there's a couple of different pistons. Another little hold one. Now here is a. I wonder what this is out of. It's a freaking. It's got the steel pin in it still, but man, it's a big, heavy piston. You see how much blow by we had here? Yeah. We had a lot of blow by on this one here, and you see where it even got a shiny spot on it being rubbed off? Yeah. Okay. Not horrible, but what uh, wow. what happened here? I'd say it got something down inside there. Big piece of something. Okay, where are these holes for? Those are for the oil. Location. Okay, we got an arrow here. So this is probably the exhaust. We're going to take a look at this. We got an intake skirt. Okay, for this, for the piston port. So something physically came out of this, and it looks like part of the pin worked its way around, got on top, and then wedged down through there. So. Bad day, right? You guys see this where it looks like it's got this funky, uh, you know, pitting along the top of it. And then we got a br bunch of broken parts here. Where the pistons actually broke off between the piston top, the crown, yeah. and this ring land, right? Mm -hmm. So this, this engine was overheated. It was getting so hot in here that the piston started to break apart. The ring uh, that's, you know, obviously held and compressed in here started to help lift this off and these pieces ended up getting smashed between the cylinder head and the piston and that's what all of these little indentations are are the pieces of the piston as they broke apart and mashed between the head and the piston. I wonder what the head looks like. A matching cylinder head would have some type of indentations like that. Oh wow. Okay now here's the thing so a lot of guys think you know what I'm just gonna get my little Dremel out and I'm gonna sand those down and I'm gonna be okay. Okay. What's anybody think of any problems with getting your Dremel out? We're not going to have as much compression because as I dig this out, okay, that means that this is going to be a larger cavity here, mm -hmm. which means that I'm not going to be able to compress it as tight. So we will have a loss of compression. It'll run. It's just not going to run as good. We've taken compression away. Why not just put a new head on? You know what I mean? It basically, there's a bunch of different ways that we could rob Peter to pay Paul type of thing. So get in here and look at this. Another thing I could do is I could grind this out, and then I could mill this surface off, shrinking it back down. But there's a lot of math involved in that, right? I mean, it's going to take a machinist. By the time you send this to a machine shop to do that, what's your labor worth to try and grind all those marks out, machine this back down? Pretty soon, you're going to be in the cost of a replacement head. It would be cheaper to replace the head. And then just be done with it and be OEM original and be good yeah. to go, okay? Here's where the real negative falls into doing this because this is common. A lot of you guys are going to take and try to polish off these sharp edges. What's the problem with the sharp edge? Let's just start with that. It's going to heat up, okay? Thin metal gets cherry red pretty quick, right? Yeah. Didn't we come to that determination? Yeah. When it gets cherry red and you introduce fuel into there, what happens? It's pretty nice. What? <clears throat> spark. So what happens is all these little dimples in here, they're going to fire before the spark plug fires. Pre-ignition 
happens in this range when the piston is coming up. Detonation happens after the combustion cycle, like you still have flame fronts colliding afterwards or on the downside. The most common one is really pre-ignition, and we'll talk about a couple of, let me just give you a couple of little quick introductions into that. So when this comes up, if we have a bunch of these hot spots that are glowing cherry red, it doesn't take very much for the fuel to be compressed. And if this is glowing cherry red and the fuel gets compressed, it, it'll basically diesel. Does that make sense? And it'll ha what'll happen is this flame front will start here. Well, now the spark plug lights and the two flame fronts coming from different directions will collide into each other. And that's what causes the rattle and the piston to, to go back and forth. Not, not a desirable thing. So all of this junk here, it isn't something that we want out there. So some people try to cheat and they'll say, well, I'll just polish off the high spots. I'm going to get it to where it's just the dimple. Carbon will fill it up soon enough and I don't have to worry about it. The problem with carbon filling it up is the fact that now the carbon will also get really hot and ignite. If you have a bunch of carbon in here, little hot spots, and it, it'll want to pinch or sandwich itself up in this combustion ring here up against that edge or the edge of the head gasket and that's another way you could end up if I have a bunch of if I have a bunch of pre-ignition going on what do you think possibly happens to the head gasket it'll blow it out okay so that's another way you could blow the head gasket as well all of these things now here's the thing I don't get if I if I want to be a true mechanic to just fix it to fix it right this right here means new head okay new piston clean up your chamber uh, or excuse me decarbon anything that's in there and then uh, life should be good. Does that make sense? <coughs> okay, well I wanted to show you a couple different versions of this um, that you guys are able to take a look at. What causes de detonation? Um, both pre-ignition and detonation are extremely caused by two things. Quality of fuel and ignition timing. Okay, so if I, let's say, for all purposes for demonstration, let's say that I have the intent to light right here where the piston is in that location but if i have my timing wrong and i light it down here i'm i'm lighting it so early that the spark plug is actually trying to push the piston down when i'm trying to overcome it yeah. okay if i fire it too late and i go ahead and light it over here and that high compression has actually caused those hot spots to light, I'm still gonna have those flame fronts. So ignition timing has an effect on, uh, on uh, that, uh, uh, ignition timing has an effect on pre-ignition or detonation. That's a big one. Now, realistically in our world, most all of our dirt bikes and ATVs are non-adjustable. So how often do you think that the computer itself actually just fails and causes it to fire at the, at the wrong time? It's almost never, okay? So our, we typically have failures of this, no spark, okay? We don't typically see weak spark. We don't typically see spark at the wrong time. We almost always have just a, uh, a, just a non-spark situation to make a vehicle not run. Not impossible, but just rare when you count the hundreds of thousands of pieces of equipment out there, okay? So now let's look into the big cause, the common cause of pre-ignition is poor fuel. If the manual calls for an 87 octane or an 89 octane or a premium octane and you use something less than, you're asking for trouble, okay? The other thing is it's not desirable to always just go use a premium fuel. Now, when I did my Articat training, I remember being shocked at the Articat factory training school of all the Canadians that were there going through it too. And the instructor kind of looked over at these guys and said, okay, you guys all know this to all the Articat dealers. What happens when you put premium fuel in the M1000? How many cc's is the M1000, you know? Or M1, I'm sorry, you're right, 1000. Okay, it's 1000 cc, two stroke, snowmobile. Okay, so here's the, here's the Canadian guys that were like, yep, yep, you lose three mile an hour. And I'm just like, putting premium fuel in, you lose three mile an hour? And Articat guys are like, okay, do you guys want to know why we, why we designed that? Why does it run better on 87, the worst pump gas you can get? So you and, can afford it. What? It's cheaper. You so can you can afford, afford it. it. That's a pretty good answer. Um, what they did is they looked at their clients. And the majority of their clients were Canadian in upper North America. Okay, And what they also did is they looked at the available fuel in those areas. Premium fuel wasn't available. 
So they actually built their highest performance snowmobile based around fuel that was available real readily at every gas station that they could get to. So with the ignition timing, the port timing, the skin, everything about that motor is actually designed to run on a lower octane fuel. If you put premium in it, you lose three mile an hour on the top end. Well, it doesn't ping? No, no, no. Actually, it'll just get lazy. It'll, uh, it'll have a lazy effect on if I remember correctly. Huh. Don't hurt set quote me on that, but uh, I, I see look at that. Like we always have this misconception that we'll put the best fuel in and it's gonna be better. How many people have ever heard of CAM2? So where do you get CAM2 racing fuel? It's real popular in every freaking small Sunoco town in dealer. Iowa. What? Sunoco, Sunoco dealer. dealer, right? How about the flat track, uh, the circle tracks? Somebody there is always selling CAM2 for the uh, stock car racing, right? It's real readily available. CAM2, it can be anywhere from 100 to 110 octane, right? And everybody thinks, well, I'm gonna put that in, I'm gonna gain a bunch of power. Almost every single bike you've ever put that in will lose power. It can't, it's not made for that high octane. It's not made for those compression ratios. It's not made for, that is made for a V8 Chevy in a flat track racing type motor that's gonna turn high RPM in a, in a V8 Chevy configuration with those ignition timing, that head design, everything else. Now there is, there are fuels out there that will really make your bike perform better. I remember at Brainerd when I was racing, the guys that were winning, guess how much they were spending on a gallon of fuel? <laughs> $25. What? $25. Yeah, it's 25 to 30 bucks a gallon. Okay. Now, I sat and watched some dynoing done on a GSXR 750 where they put regular fuel in it, dynoed it, and uh, it was 120 some horsepower, or whatnot. They drained the fuel, put race fuel in it, and it was 140. Didn't change anything but the fuel. It was a really, really heavy oxygenated fuel. And then they, they had to jet it and, and then tune it to that fuel. And I think I saw like 145s that day on the dyno doing nothing but fuel you want to win races you're going to pay for it you know what i, I mean guess. so anyway so today let's get simple let's bring it back down to an entry level mechanic you're going to build these motors and your your ignition timing's is not adjustable on most of them boom you put it in so what's the training piece that you have to know for your customer i'm talking about the two things to eliminate this ignition timing we're getting that one out we're going to make it stock it's oh, going to be good warm up the right fuel Quality of fuel, quality of fuel. Your customer has to know that if they go out there and they accidentally put a real heavy ethanol fuel in there and it's not designed for that, you could potentially have some problems. It's not common that we want to use ethanol fuel in the bikes because it's an oxygenated fuel. What did we say about oxygen in the Suzuki video? It raises what inside the engine? Temperature. The temperature. So we would typically want to run. So when you go down here to Casey's, you have two versions of 87 octane, right? Yeah, yeah. Regular and then the ethanol. You have the ethanol and you have the regular. You would want to use regular 87, not the ethanol stuff, and then mix it accordingly with the right fuel. Now, ideally, if I guarantee if you go to a Suzuki operator's manual, they tell us to run a premium fuel. We'd really like to run a 91, okay? That's what I run. Yeah, that's good stuff. The other thing that we want to do is we really, 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 really want to go to a gas station. Hear me out on this. You'll hear me talk about it uh, over and over come next March when you do fuel systems. But for right now, you want to buy your gas at a gas station that has individual yes. uh, lines to the pump. Yeah. Okay, most gas stations you go in, there's not as many out there anymore. When you go into a gas station, you pull up for your car, you're typically going to have one hose to select between two to three different types of fuels. I was in Nebraska here a few weeks ago and there was one hose and five fuels. Oof. There was a couple of different uh, E85s, they had a couple different in ethanol, non-ethanol, they had an 89, they had premium, all in one fuel line. From what I'm told, and I had some students research this last year and they were unsuccessful in getting an exact data, but they say that from the selector switch in the pump to the nozzle in your hand, can be almost as much as a gallon of fuel. So when you go to a gas pump with one hose in multiple grades, the first gallon of gas you get, well, we're just gonna be dramatic about it, okay? And I'd love if anybody wants to research it even further. Is I, uh, that first gallon of fuel is whatever the last person purchased and bought. So you gotta think about that. You're paying for a premium fuel and the last person got 87, you're kind of getting ripped off on that first gallon of fuel, aren't you? Yeah, you are. I jumped up and injected this.
What's that? I gummed up when the jets are doing that. Did you? I bought it and I didn't put the first gallon in like the truck or whatever. Oh. And it, uh, there's so much water in it that it gummed up my injector. I had to buy an injector. Holy cow.